before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about my experience with each of the speakers today. Um, I'm going to try to share a quick picture. Uh, let's see. Louise, can you see this one okay? Yeah. All right. This is one of my favorite uh, memories of working with Louise Rollins-Smith, who is an immunologist from uh, Vanderbilt University. And um, this is from 2010. I can hardly believe it. But um, we went to the, to the field and collected a lot of samples from amphibians there. And Louise is actually really great in the field catching frogs um, <laughs> and uh, but specializes in the lab on immunology. Um, and uh, this is a, a team of us that went. Um, but I, and I did my postdoc with Louise in, uh, um, for, for a few years after my PhD. And then after I was in Louise's lab, I went to James Madison University, which is where I first met Kevin. And Kevin is a, a great chemist and has been um, uh, wonderful to work with and figuring out some of the compounds that um, the microbes uh, from amphibian skin make. And uh, he is now at Villanova University and is the, the chair of the chemistry department. Um, and I haven't worked with you in the field yet, but maybe one day we'll get a chance to do that. I'm not that good at it. Okay. <laughs> but um, uh, so welcome both of you and thanks, thanks so much for, um, for joining us today. Okay, I'm gonna switch to screen share. And make sure you all can see this. All right, so is that showing up? Yeah. Everyone see my screen? Okay, great. Thanks, Doug. I remember that uh, 2010 trip too very well. So it was, <laughs> it was uh, maybe a little more excitement uh, over some of those uh, rough Panama uh, roads, but uh, but you were a great uh, driver of the four four wheel drive vehicle. So uh, Doug said he was my first postdoc. He was a really creative uh, postdoc and very creative and productive postdoc, and he's become a very creative and productive scientist in his own right. So this is going to be a two part uh, seminar. I'm going to go first. Uh, and tell you sort of about the biology of uh, uh, immune defenses against chytrid pathogens linked to global amphibian declines. And then Kevin's going to follow up and tell you more about the chemistry uh, involved. So I think this is a really good illustration of the importance of collaborative studies. So at some point, we kind of needed the the services of natural products chemists, we turned to Kevin, and, and Kevin helped us solve some of the problems, uh, understanding what the pathogen is making that could inhibit the immune defenses. So what we're looking at here is a beautiful barking tree frog from my part of the world, and it's one of the species that's impacted by chytrid pathogens that have been linked to amphibian declines. So those declines have been going on for at least four decades, decades more if you start counting earlier. We know there are complex causes, habitat destruction, pollution, introduced species. There are a lot of causes, but among those causes, I think everyone would agree that infectious diseases, emerging diseases, are one of the most important causes. So my lab has really focused on uh, the chytrid fungi that have caused uh, skin, the skin disease, which we call chytridiomycosis. So the first chytrid, the trichochytrin dendrobatidis that we abbreviate DD, was first described in 1998. It's thought to have originated in Asia, and it is widespread globally. The second fungus, the Trichochytrium salamandrivorans, was described in 2013. It is also thought to have originated in Asia and has been lethal to European salamanders in Belgium and the Netherlands where it was accidentally introduced. 
And one of the, the um, unfortunate affected species are these beautiful fire salamanders in, in that part of the world. So just a little reminder of the life cycle of the trachotitrium. It has a swimming zoospore that makes it sort of a primitive fungus. Uh, and the zoospore can infect the mouth parts of the tadpole or more directly the keratinized skin cells of the adult. It, it transforms into a stage we call a germling. Uh, the germling matures into a zoosporangium. The zoosporangium differentiates a number of zoospores. And when the skin is moving toward the surface to be sloughed off, a discharge tube opens and the, the swimming zoospores swim out to infect another area of the skin or infect, uh, infect a, a, new, a new frog. So this is kind of a model of, of how uh, we think about the immune defenses in the skin. There's a layer of mucus, and within that layer of mucus on the skin are antimicrobial peptides that are produced in uh, large granular glands. Um, many species have these granular glands and, and produce antimicrobial peptides. This is an image of a granular gland from Xenopus. And you can see the material that's being discharged from the granular gland. In addition to antimicrobial peptides, there's lysozyme, which can degrade gram-positive bacteria. There are antibodies produced by B cells somewhere. We think those B cells, there's a B cell compartment somewhere in the skin, but we don't know very much about it. And then there are, there is the community of bacteria that also inhabit the mucus. This has been sort of the area of focus of Doug Woodhams for quite some time now. Uh, and he's, he's showing us lots of variety in those uh, species of bacteria that live in the amphibian skin and, and the way that they also play a role in protection. So once the zoospore lands in the, in the mucus, if it survives those sort of chemical defenses, then it forms a germ tube. This is a germ tube. This is an electron micro micrograph showing those germ tubes, which carry the contents of the zoospore into the intracellular compartment. And that's where it would change the properties of the affected cells. The uh, antigen presenting, the antigen patrolling cells, dendritic cells and macrophages should be able to recognize something foreign and begin to activate an immune response. And, and I'll tell you more about that later uh, as we go on. But first, I'm going to focus on the, the antimicrobial peptide defenses. And, and I should say that we, we focus on the skin because unlike other fungal pathogens that disseminate throughout the body, this one really stays confined to the skin. So in order to understand the immune defenses, we really have to focus on what's going on in the skin. So how do we study the antimicrobial peptides? And I should say, when Doug was a graduate student in Australia, he helped to develop many of these methods that we use to study the antimicrobial peptides. So we take a, a frog like a northern leopard frog and drop it in a collection buffer, either without applying a stimulus or by sort of agitating the frog to irritate it, or by injecting it with norepinephrine to induce the discharge of those granular glands. So it stays in the buffer for about 15 minutes. The frog releases its antimicrobial peptides, take the frog out, add uh, a strong acid to inhibit any proteases. So we don't want the antimicrobial peptides to degrade. Then we pass that material over a, a C18 material, which binds to the hydrophobic peptides. So antimicrobial peptides have generally have sort of an, uh, a hydrophobic uh, side, and so they're, they're bound. And we can loot them, we can concentrate them, we can uh, look at their uh, patterns by mass spectrometry, and we can test their activity uh, in inhibition of the zoospore growth. 
So this is a profile of uh, the, uh, the mass spectrometry profile of some of those enriched skin peptides from the northern leopard frog. There's a cluster of peptides called bovinins. There's another group called ronoturins. There's another uh, defensive uh, peptide called bradykinin, which also is often found. Uh, and what is important about this slide is that I'm showing you that in a resting frog that hasn't been activated or a frog that's been irritated, agitated by chasing in a box, uh, you can find the peptides as well as in the norepinephrine-induced uh, skin secretions. And in growth inhibition assays, we're looking at the optical density growth of the cells uh, with nothing or uh, killed by heat or in the presence of antimicrobial peptides. And what's important here again is that the resting frog, the chased frog, and the norepinephrine-induced frog all have peptides that can inhibit growth of the zoospores. And if you think about that very thin mucus layer, so it's not very thick, but the quantities of peptides that can be found in that mucus layer are really quite high. So as much as two mg per mil in a resting frog, as much as six mg per mil in that agitated, irritated frog. Uh, and, and I'm showing you that you really only need about 200 micrograms per mil or even less uh, to inhibit subspore growth. So there's plenty of peptides in that thin mucus layer to inhibit zoospores. If you deplete those peptides by more than one injection of norepinephrine, so essentially cause the emptying of those granular glands. Here are the full glands. Here are the uh, empty granular glands in the skin of a, of a young, naive uh, northern leopard frog, just uh, a bit post-metamorphosis. Those uh, peptide-depleted frogs now are much more susceptible to infection and, uh, and uh, disease and death. So I want to move on and show you the importance of studying the antimicrobial peptides in a population of frogs, especially one that has been impacted by uh, heterodeomycosis in, in a very significant way. So Doug and others have been uh, studying the, the species of amphibians in Panama since about 2004 or even earlier. Uh, and so because Doug and Jamie Boyles and Corey Richard Sawaki and others went frequently to uh, Panama, we were able to essentially uh, find populations before the chytrid outbreaks and then again after the chytrid out outbreaks, study their antimicrobial peptides, study the presence of disease, the relative intensity of the infection, and, and quantify the hydrophobic peptides. So this is uh, just a figure from uh, Jamie Boyle's paper in which Doug and I uh, contributed uh, from 2018, looking at uh, three regions of Panama where the, the populations were studied over a number of years. And what Jamie is showing here is that a number of species were very abundant before the disease and they declined. And now in recent years, they're coming back, they're recovering. And if you look at the community, uh, Jamie was able to show that the communities now are returning to more of a configuration of the pre-disease condition. So having declined, now a number of these species are beginning to, to come back. So Jamie asked the question of what's different? Has the pathogen become less virulent or have the hosts changed their characteristics? And, and the question is, how do you study that? So, uh, the way that uh, we chose to study it is to look at new isolates that have been uh, 
collected from the frogs recently in, in essentially 2013, 2014, and compare those to prior archived uh, isolates that were present during the epidemics. And then uh, use a susceptible species, in this case, the Adelopus varius, the harlequin frog, uh, and, and look at their susceptibility. And what you can see is that the contemporary isolates are just as virulent, just as capable of causing uh, death and just as capable of causing high intensity uh, development of, uh, of the chytrid in the skin as were the historic isolates. One other measure of the uh, virulence of this pathogen is to look at their ability to inhibit lymphocytes. So this is one characteristic that we have discovered that the, the the fungus is able to inhibit lymphocytes. So we compared again the historic isolates to the contemporary isolates, and we were able to show that uh, the contemporary ones are just as good at inhibiting lymphocytes as the historic ones were. So by these criteria, the fungus is just as virulent, just as deadly as it was uh, when the epidemics began. So what is different? One of the things that is different, and this is why I'm, I'm telling you about it, is that when you look at the skin peptides from a number of these species, their activities before the disease outbreaks, and then their activities more recently when the disease is more in uh, an enzootic phase, the activity of the peptides is greater now, greater after the pathogen has come into the communities. This is, this, uh, is another uh, image that shows the um, activity of peptides isolated from Adelopus that had been taken out of the wild, grown in captivity, compared to the peptides from wild-caught uh, Adelopus. And there's a very significant difference in the, in the capabilities of those that have been in captivity for some time. So this suggests, we don't really fully understand it, but it suggests that the skin defenses have improved after the pathogen was introduced. So I'm gonna switch gears here and talk a little bit about the adaptive immune system. I told you that um, within the skin, when the pathogen is uh, infecting uh, the epidermal cells, the uh, patrolling immune cells should recognize it as foreign, should begin to do something about it. So we've asked, is there a role for the B lymphocytes? So those antibodies in the mucus play a role. Is there a role for T lymphocytes? And when the, the skin, def skin defenses are seem inadequate, what, how does the BD get around it? How does it evade those uh, adaptive immune defenses? Uh, so one of the ways that we looked at this is just to do some uh, in vitro co-culture experiments in which we take lymphocytes from the spleen, induce them to do what they do to proliferate by stimulating with a plant lectin, PHA, and then introducing increasing numbers of chytrid cells. When you do that, the more chytrid cells you add, the more inhibitory they are. This, this is an assay of activity of T cells. This is an assay of activity of the B cells. You stimulate with killed bacteria, Aeromonas hydrophila, instead of the plant lectin. The B cells proliferate, and again, when you add in increasing numbers of uh, chytrid mature sporangia, they significantly inhibit that proliferation. So we asked whether it was uh, a cell-cell interaction effect or whether it was something produced by the fungus. Uh, so we uh, essentially developed a method of growing the, the zoosporangia up to high concentrations, culturing them for 24 hours in just pure uh, uh, sterile glass distilled water. We spin out the cells, filter it, 
lyophilized and tested. And you can see that the supernatant as well, no cells, just the supernatant is very capable of inhibiting that same lymphocyte proliferation. Uh, this is a little bit of a teaser slide. Uh, 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 Kevin is going to tell you more about this. We have only begun to study the uh, activities of B cell, the second chytrid fungus, uh, looking at their effects on uh, lymphocyte proliferation. And again, when we do the co-culture experiment, adding the, the fungus directly to the lymphocytes, the B cell sporangia also inhibit, and the B cell supernames also inhibit. So just to show you that it's not just a culture phenomenon, my, uh, my graduate student, Scott Feitz, who, who did most of these experiments, uh, developed uh, a de delayed type hypersensitivity uh, reaction, so uh, assay. Uh, this is something like a tuberculin test or sort of like a poison IV response once the antigen has been introduced. And in this case, it was the plant lectin, again, PHA. Uh, then somewhat later, if you introduce it locally by injection, you'll get a swelling response. Uh, so Scott showed that if you uh, do this kind of experiment and you add the supernatant along with the PHA, the swelling response is strongly reduced. So this shows you that it's not just an in, in culture phenomenon, but in fact, uh, you can inhibit an, a, a, a skin uh, response directly in the frog. So what's the mechanism? We looked a little bit at, at the mechanism and we can show when you do uh, sort of uh, a, um, a, a two chamber experiment in which you have the, the uh, lymphocytes on the bottom and the chytrid on the top across a membrane that prevents the cells but allows the, the molecules to pass, you can show without the fungus, you get a low level of uh, apoptosis measured by MXM5 PI staining. But when you have the, the fungus on the top, you get a much greater level of apoptosis. So we think at least one of the mechanisms by which the lymphocytes are inhibited is that they uh, undergo uh, apoptosis. Uh, Scott went on to show that you can boil those supernatants, you can treat them with proteinase K, and they're still highly active, which suggests that they're probably not proteins or, or peptides. So I'm just going to summarize my part here, and then I'm going to pass it off to Kevin. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of the antimicrobial peptides, Frogs are able to constitutively produce and release low amounts of those antimicrobial habit peptides that are inhibitory. Uh, they're quite effective at these low constitutive concentrations. If you deplete those peptides, the susceptibility to BD is increased. Uh, and recovery of some of the amphibians in Panama is at least correlated with improved effectiveness of those skin secretions. The BD and B cell factors uh, can in inhibit lymphocyte functions by induction of apoptosis. They're heat resistant, protease resistant, suggesting they're not proteins or peptides. And this is where we turn to our collaborators at Villanova and at Harvard to uh, study the nature of those supernatants. What is in those uh, inhibitory substances. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to just have one more slide. This, this uh, shows the people in my lab presently uh, and uh, some of the graduate students who contributed to this work um, that I've just told you about. And with that, I will stop my screen share and let Kevin continue the story. Awesome, Louise. See if I can bring this up. All right, would someone give me a holler if you can hear me and see a laser pointer? Looks good. Yeah, we can awesome. see it. Great. 
Thanks, guys. Um, gosh, it's really an honor to be able to um, present to, to your department today and, and to be able to follow Louise. I've never actually heard her give a talk before, so this is pretty great. And to have the teasers that she um, provided to me was, was pretty amazing, too. Um, so thanks, Louise, and thanks, Doug, for the invite. Um, so at the risk of, of being the chemist hanging out with um, some biologists, I would like to take some time to talk about how some of the chemical ecology happens in my research group um, and then pick back up on some of the teasers that Louise was providing to us. Um, so from my perspective, uh, we study chemical ecology. So how do chemicals mediate interactions between different species? We, I like to view the amphibian skin as, as an ecosystem with a whole lot of chemical warfare. So this is a drawing from Rob Brucker, um, who was in my group before and moving on to Vanderbilt and has worked with uh, a lot of folks in this space. We see kind of a, a, a three-way fight or with you know, some symbiosis going on. Um, and, and this I had really been introduced to by Reed Harris, maybe like 2005 or so, when he was starting to tell us back then that amphibians were um, facing this chytrid fungus, as Louise introduced. But he had proposed the idea that symbiotic bacteria were a key provider of, of protection for the amphibians. Um, so that opened up a space for some chemists to jump in to try to understand really the mechanistic underpinnings of what's going on. There's a lot of possibilities of helping and hurting um, folks, and we kind of wrote it out this way, um, whereas these symbiotic bacteria get a nice place to live on their amphibians. Um, there's a protection afforded to the amphibians by the bacteria. So we spent a good 10 years trying to figure out what some of the antifungal metabolites are that are built by bacterial symbionts, and this has continued on to working um, with Doug. Um, we suspect that BD might be trying to fight the bacteria as well, um, but Louise has been really highlighting this corner of this triangle where we now know, um, thanks to a lot of work by Louise, that there's a lot of antimicrobial peptides produced by amphibians. Um, but the last bit is that we want to find out, as Louise was talking about, what are some of these immunosuppressive compounds built by BD, and we'll get to B-cell, um, that have an effect on the amphibians. All right, so here are just some of the compounds that we've identified in our research group when, when working with the groups of Harris and Rollins Smith and Woodhams. Um, so, Here's some of the structures that we've found. Sorry to get you on a Friday afternoon, some organic chemistry. Um, long time ago, we started off with diacetylfluoroglucinol, um, a compound we found in Lysobacter, a couple of compounds in, in Janfinobacter, indole-3-carboxaldehyde, and my personal favorite, violacine. Um, prodigiosin we found in Seracia that, and uh, wrote a paper together with the Woodhams group about prodigiosin and violacine. Um, also teaming up with Doug, we looked at some toxins coming from toads, so bufodienolides, including arena bufagen. Um, themes that you might see amongst all of these compounds are, now think back to your organic chemistry days where you've got alternating double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. This conjugation tends to make these compounds much easier to identify using, using either visible light or UV light. Um, so that helps us with the identification of these. And these are all compounds that have been shown to have good anti-BD activity. All right, so just a little bit of a philosophical approach that comes from my research group. We want to find compounds, and we want to do it in a non-destructive sort of way. So uh, we've worked hard over the years to try to come up with different ways to find chemical samples from from amphibians. Uh, Tom Umale, who was a postdoc and is now on the faculty here at Villanova, um, helped us develop ways to take really simple foam swabs, so polyurethane foam swabs, which look a heck of a lot like Q-tips. Um, we developed ways that you can grab an amphibian, give it a quick swab on the back, release the amphibian to allow for kind of um, temporal studies of what's going on, we can store these swabs, or folks in the field can uh, store these, do an extraction, 
and then um, prepare them for LCMS, which I'll get to explaining in a bit, and gather some data from it. So between these swabs and some other favorites, just washing some of our frogs or having culture supernatants if we're dealing with bacterium, are all ways that we can access some of these chemicals to do analyses. Um, the analyses themselves use a whole lot of acronyms for me to throw at you on a Friday afternoon. Um, in order to separate the compounds to get them more pure, we use HPLC. So chromatography is a means to separate things. We use high performance chroma liquid chromatography, separating our compounds by polarity, not unlike the set packs that Louise was talking about. Uh, we use spectroscopy, UV spectroscopy, um, UV vis, that we can see these compounds more easily, as I alluded to before, oftentimes with these conjugated double bonds. Mass spectrometry is our strategy to identify compounds by molecular weight. Unlike the MALDI work that Doug and Louise had done, we use electrospray ionization. And we can lump all three of these together using LCMS, so high performance liquid chromatography, coupled with at least mass spectrometry at the back end, sometimes UV vis spectroscopy as well. So when Louise said, hey, what are the compounds that are going on in these BD supernatants? So that this is an example of the raw data that we would come up with. So HPLC would provide us with this information of some separated out compounds. Initially, we didn't know what they were. Um, but plenty of UV active compounds in these supernatants. And of course, we're hoping that we can identify some of these as the immunosuppressive compounds built by BD, but initially didn't really know what to do. It's a primitive fungus. Um, we weren't really sure what structures we might find. Here's what we found. Um, one thing that wasn't a big surprise was tryptophan. Um, so this is, amongst all the amino acids, probably the most UV active. So we saw this guy, but didn't really think of it as um, an immunosuppressive agent. Um, metabolic decomposition product of tryptophan is kynurinine. So you can see structurally it's pretty similar. You lost a carbon and popped open one of the rings um, to make kynurinine. That's this peak here. Another of the major peaks was methylthioadenosine, which I'll just refer to as MTA. Um, it's important when it's methylated, it's kind of the methyl transfer agent throughout all of life, um, S as an adenosyl methionine. Um, so these were kind of the main compounds that we wanted to look at. Some of the things that come off a little bit earlier out of the column oftentimes are junk. So we kind of wanted to look and see are kynurinine and MTA biologically relevant? So we know that a lot is made by BD. Do they have any effect on lymphocytes? So that same panel is here in the top left. And the answer is yes, kind of. So um, these are all experiments done in Louise's lab. So my, my apologies for anything poorly explained. Um, so if we've got frog lymphocytes that are stimulated again by this plant lectin PHA, um, we find that increasing amounts of MTA, so that's methyl thioadenosine right here, lead to an inhibition of lymphocyte growth. Not wonderfully active. We see some activity at 10 micromolar, but you have to get to 100 micromolar in, it in order to see something statistically significant. Um, not too different for kynurinine. Uh, you need to get to relatively high concentrations of kynurinine to show some lymph lymphocyte inhibition. Fortunately, Louise went on to see if there was any activity of the two working together. And indeed, there was synergy, which is pretty exciting. So in lower concentrations of kynurinine, so just 0.25 millimolar, you'd see some increased activity of kynurinine in the presence of MTA. So while these compounds are not potent immunosuppressants in and of themselves, they, they do have some activity, but in cahoots with each other, we see some significant synergy. So we're excited this was reported in 2015. Um, we suspected it wasn't the entirety of the story. Um, so at this point, it was kind of good that Louise went behind my back and found another chemistry collaborator. Um, so she knows John Clardy and his uh, former student, Tony Rosini, who's now a professor at Saskatchewan, uh, proposed another compound, and it was spermidine. 
So I'm not exactly sure what experiments came out of the Harvard labs that said, hey, maybe BD makes spermidine as well. Um, and they proposed that it might be immunosuppressive too. So this made some sense in some ways and, and not sense in other ways. Um, in a biosynthetic pathway to the production of MTA, um, well, the, the, the biosynthesis of spermidine immediately kicks off MTA in the step before producing spermidine as you decompose a couple of amino acids, ornithine, uh, a non-canonical one, um, you can decompose to putrescine and then it gives spermidine. So I, initially, I, I'm not gonna lie, I was a little bit skeptical. John Clardy had published on spermidine for very different other uses. It was proposed as an anti-biofilm agent. Um, so it didn't make a ton of sense that it would be used in a very different uh, sort of system, but we could associate it with the biosynthesis. Uh, so it seemed worth going after. Uh, of course, it proposed a problem. The analyses that I had talked about up until now were not gonna work to identify whether spermidine was present or not in some of these BD supernatants. Um, against it, it's a rather small molecule, smaller than we usually look for on mass spectrometry. And it doesn't have any of those bits of conjugations or, or, or double bonds for us to see it using UV vis. Fortunately, um, we're a natural products group. We do organic synthesis and we recognize that someone at Harvard is probably more right than we are. Um, so we did some chemical modifications. So we took spermidine and exposed it to danzyl chloride, which did a chemical modification to build these sulfonamides, uh, which had a few different pluses to them. And this was initially done in the lab of Tom Umale, uh, who was a postdoc. He went on to go to Mercy University and then is now back at Villanova. So his lab was able to do this danzylation well to make this triply modified compound. So you can see the three nitrogens in spermidine are all modified by this danzyl group, which does a bunch of things. Um, it makes the compound less polar, uh, which makes it a lot easier to identify on HPLC. These are very visibly colorful groups, a bright yellow, so that's gonna allow for better UV vis detection. And the mass of this triply danzylated compound is something that we could readily see on LCMS. So now at least we got a better shot at finding this. Um, so here's how it would look in a sample LCMS chromatogram. Um, comparing this to putrescine after a couple of danzel groups are put on there. Um, fun fact, putrescine does smell as bad as you might imagine. Um, so we, we had built these standards and then went back to the BD uh, supernatants that Louise had, prom uh, had provided to us, tried this dancillation. Lo and behold, we were able to quantify, or at least reasonably well quantify these super BD supernatants as having on the order of one to 10 micromolar, so a small amount, but a measurable amount of spermidine. Okay, so the Clardy group proposed that spermidine was there. We could quantify it to a decent degree. The question is, is it biologically relevant? Is it an immunosuppressive compound? And the answer is yes. So in reasonably low concentrations, spermidine is able to inhibit growth of frog lymphocytes as low as 10 micromolar. We can see some diminishing of the, of the growth of the lymphocytes. So this is a single experiment. Here's kind of a bunch where you can see something like 50% inhibition at the level of 10 micromolar. Even more exciting is that spermidine, abbreviated SPD here, in the presence of some of the other metabolites is even more effective. So if you have just a one micromolar concentration of spermidine, but you spike in MTA, I forget the levels, maybe 10 micromolar, you see a significant increase in the anti, well, the, the inhibition of lymphocyte growth. So this suggests that this rather primitive fungus has a, a real strategy for in, inhibiting the uh, immune response in frogs. It's not by building any particularly complicated compounds, but it's in building a suite of compounds that work synergistically with each other. 
So as Louise had pointed out, um, about 15 years after the identification of BD came along B. Sal as an additional chytrid threat. Um, since it's about 15 years later in its identification, we know a whole lot less about B. Sal. And Louise uh, gave the teaser that we were gonna try to see if B. Sal makes some of these same compounds. Um, and as she had said, the B cell cells are definitely able to inhibit the lymphocytes, both as the cells and as the supernatant coming from now either BD or B cell cells. So it's pretty cool. You can just have the sporangia um, in pure water, which stresses them out. Um, and uh, the, uh, the supernatant comes to us what we're able to find out is absolutely yes, kynurinine and MTA and spermidine are in fact present, present in the B cell supernatants. So we upped our game a little bit. We started using LCMS with a, a different program. So multiple reaction monitoring let us kind of ignore a lot of the noise and look very specifically. If you can maybe see this, there's a little red blip for kynurinine a green blip for MTA. We also looked for tryptophan just to see if it was there. Um, separately, we could do that danzelation procedure and then LCMS, not a lot, but we were able to see um, spermidine in these supernatants as well. All right, so that means that both BD and B-cell, these relatively um, primitive fungi, are able to make each of these three and have some real analogy in how they go after immune cells in frogs. Um, so here's a slide that I'm likely to struggle with, so Louise, jump in if you need. So this kind of brings back the same model that Louise had. And now we're able to add a whole lot more knowledge of, again, here's kynurinine's structure and spermidine and MTA. Um, so not only have we shown that these compounds in concert are able to inhibit the growth of lymphocytes, uh, in further experiments, Louise was able to show that they can kind of uh, induce the T cells to have less of an immune response. Um, Louise, jump in if that's uh, not an acceptable uh, way to phrase it. Um, yeah, it's true for mammalian cells. We haven't shown it yet for frogs, but it's another possible mechanism. Brilliant. Yes, so these relatively simple compounds and commonplace compounds um, seem to have some immunological effects. So to summarize, uh, my half and, and Louise's as well, um, we've been able to show, or Louise's group was able to show that there are factors built by BD and B-cell to inhibit lymphocyte function. Um, we were given the, the great suggestion that since they're heat resistant and protease resistant, they're not peptides, which is why you recruit a small molecule chemist like myself. And these small molecules indeed include MTA, kynurinine, and spermidine, which work okay alone, but in concert are pretty potent at inhibiting lymphocyte growth. Um, we can thus conclude that BD and B cell do have these strategies that are akin to each other in order to survive in amphibian skin. A lot of work is ongoing in our lab and Louise's lab to, to get better knowledge of what's going on in the immune cells, perhaps in the skin cells, and better understand this immune evasion. So I get the honor of putting the acknowledgements slide back up. Um, Louise has started, but I'll kind of continue on. Here's some folks from the Rollins Smith lab. They're awfully nice. I got to go out to Vanderbilt a couple of years ago and spend some time, um, and they very patiently had me look at zoospores in a microscope. Um, here's me. You'll notice the chemists generally have chemical structures drawn behind us, because apparently that's how we operate. Um, Tom Umale, the two master's students, because Villanova has a small master's program in chemistry, or Bria Gillard and Julia Tasca. And here's team Harvard who helped us with the spermidine idea and the National Science Foundation has provided generous funding for these. And at this point, we're happy to take any questions that you all might have. And I think Doug, you are muted. Wow, thanks so much, Louise and Kevin. Uh, <laughs> um, I think we can take questions in the Q&A uh, link at the bottom. Um, and 
I, I will read them off and uh, I'll let you guys uh, answer. It can sometimes take a few minutes for folks to get their questions all typed up. Sure. Um, I don't know if you have any questions for them after after this talk, but uh, I really appreciated this nice overview of all the really hard mechanistic work that you guys are doing. Um, do you mind if I ask a question? Please, Brooke. Uh, I, I'm curious to know whether you see this is sort of a big, a big question. Do you see uh, our research reaching the point where we can overcome the threat before, before too much catastrophe? Do you think the work will get there fast enough or do you see that, that there's that kind of delay? Well, I, I think um, to some extent the, the frogs are doing it on their own. So those recoveries in Panama and those recoveries in a few other places suggest that uh, there's sort of a uh, some kind of a evolutionary process going on by which they they may be getting better defenses and um, human interventions maybe for the um, the most vulnerable species bringing them into captivity uh, for a time uh, and then letting them go again. Uh, I mean that's a that's one strategy. There, the probiotics that Doug is working on that, that's another potential uh, strategy for very vulnerable species. But um, yeah, yeah, I I'm always optimistic. Along those lines, is there a are there any is there any way to sort of deactivate these simple compounds, Kevin, that are, are being detected? Or is this something that's just their, this is part of their, the, the fungus, its normal um, metabolism? Or is there a way that maybe there's a treatment to, you know, knock out the function of, of some of these compounds? They're, they're relatively simple metabolites. And they're things that are just kind of uh, standard secondary metabolites, or I guess some primary metabolites. Um, so shutting down S adenosyl methionine's major precursor might <laughs> cause more problems <laughs> um, than good that it would cause. It's an interesting strategy to use very simple compounds in concert to, to have a big effect. It might be difficult for me to even imagine how to inhibit or to, to stop some of these functions. Oh, interesting. So here's a question from Brandon LeBombard. He asks, uh, with tryptophan being expressed in the BD supernatant, could that also be helpful for um, JLIV for producing violacine? So BD is helping the skin microbes produce anti-BD metabolites? <laughs> um, Brandon, that's an excellent question. Um, and and I've, I've wrestled this, with this a little bit. So it wouldn't make any sense, right, for BD to make something that one of its prime enemies uses to turn into violacine to thwart it. Um, there may be a simpler answer, Brandon, um, that at least one of our chemical analysis methods is really good at identifying tryptophan. Um, so since it's, the, the, it's a simple amino acid, but it's the one that is the most UV active and easiest to detect, it's possible that there's tryptophan going all over the place and we just happen to see it the most rapidly because it's just very UV active. And there may be oodles of the other 19 normal amino acids that are around. That's just the one that we see the most. Um, so I, I wrestle with the fact that we keep seeing these indole type molecules all over the place, but it could just be an artifact of the simple chemical methods that we're using that overrepresent the, the prevalence of these compounds. Thanks. Um, so Rob, Robert Stevenson uh, asks, how might water stress impact these responses? Uh, so uh, I'm not sure. Um, uh, by, by that you mean dehydration, would dehydration um, 
I think any kind of stressor that might uh, increase corticosteroids could inhibit the synthesis of some of these antimicrobial peptides. So long-term stresses that impaired uh, synthesis uh, and release of those peptides could have an impact. Uh, that's the only direct effect that I can think of. I, I wonder, sorry, Louise, I wondered if this question was coming from one of Kevin's slides where he said, when you have the cultures uh, like, you know, BD growing in oh. broth, then you switch it out to growing in water, and then you get those compounds produced. I don't know if that's where the question is coming from, but I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I always, I always view that as a stress, because that's not, you know, a normal living environment. Plus, it makes it a lot easier for me because you've removed all the other compounds. Um, but Louise, you should probably answer that better. Right. So I think that's a great question. Uh, and we've been thinking about whether temperature stress or switching it into a medium that uh, is, you know, it's been happily growing in, in rich broth, suddenly you take that broth away. Or uh, maybe something, you know, I think about it as maybe uh, macrophages might be releasing a hydrogen peroxide or something like that, which is another big stressor that might turn on some of these. So that, that's a great question. And uh, we've thought about going down that line. We just haven't done it yet. Uh, Laura asks, um, Kevin, do you have any sense of how the concentrations of metabolites differ between BD and B cell supernatants? Great question, Laura. I assume this is Laura Reinert, um, who's the extraordinarily patient member of the Robin Smith group, who uh, taught me how to use a micro microscope to actually see the zoospores. So, hi, Laura. Um, uh, my, my answer is, I think to the best of our ability, they're on par with each other. So I, I think that, you know, we might be off by a decent amount. So, and Louise, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm, I'm thinking we're seeing pretty comparable amounts of spermidine, for example, in both BD and B cell. So at the detection limits that I present, about the same. So the answer could be a little bit up or a little bit down, as we've seen in the temperature dependence um, work that we're still kind of working on, um, but about the same. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Adan asks if uh, spermidines are abundant in plants, or he says spermidines are abundant in plants and are involved in many functions uh, in development as well as in biotic stress response. What's known about the relationship between amphibians slash fungi slash bacteria and plants? All right, so now I am fully convinced, Aiden, that I'm totally underestimating the prevalence of spermidine out there. I didn't, did not know that they're abundant in plants. Um, uh, <laughs> Louise, I don't know, do you have an answer? <laughs> No, uh, not a good one. Uh, yeah, I think you're right that um, spermidine is probably um, produced by lots of different uh, lots of different organisms. Uh, you know, we're thinking that it is um, sort of a stress response in the fungus when the immune system is uh, attacking it, um, but but we haven't really directly shown that so. Um, I, I don't know plants, amphibians, fungi, uh, if there's any group <laughs> interaction. I wish I could unmute Adan somehow and... and I, I've just enabled that. I'm also going to unmute Laura and um, uh, Rob because you have follow-up comments, I think. Hi, this is Adan. Uh, I guess what the reason why I was asking that question is because in, in the real world, you're also going to have plants, you know, in, in pools and things like that. So I was just curious about the contribution of uh, sperm reading coming from plants in that environment, but maybe it's just not known yet. Yeah, it, I guess if, um, if the concentration was very high, close to where those um, so it's the spermidine is inhibiting the lymphocytes. So I guess if plants were releasing a lot of it 
they could potentially uh, have a role in, in some of those lymphocyte compartments in the skin, but um, it would sort of have to be a pretty high concentration coming from the plants, I would think. Or if there's some sort of low level concentration of spermidine that's around, you know, it can be potentiated in the presence of MTA since they do work synergistically. That's, that's a pretty clever thought, Adan. Thank you. And, and Louise, we could, we could do that analysis. We can <laughs> try to find some pond water or something that's relatively you know, relevant and just say, okay, can we find spermidine in pond water? Like according to the same methods that we've used before, um, just to see if there's a measurable amount there. I would be shocked if you didn't, especially during um, uh, any wind pollinated season, because mm -hmm. pollen often has, or floral structures have spermidine involved with them. We need to see the amounts, right? Just to see is it you know, way above or way below. Really cool. Didn't think about mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, um, well, thanks uh, again, and thanks for all the participants. Um, before, uh, before we go, I wanted to just remind everybody there's a happy hour. So I'm not sure how this, I wish we could all be together in person, um, but we're gonna have a virtual happy hour. So there's a link that I think was provided to everyone to go to another Zoom. Not to everybody yet. So I'm going to share it in the chat. If you're not on the UMass Boston Biology Seminar email list, I'll share it in the chat right now. Um, give me one second. Okay. Yeah, but we could answer more questions there or, uh, or talk about other topics too. <laughs> At this happy hour, how do you provide cocktails all the way to Tennessee and to <laughs> how does that? Like, <laughs> virtually. <laughs> We'll, we'll figure something. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Brooke, you're putting it in the in the chat. Is that? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So I think. Sorry, it just took me a second to find it. Um, please, anyone, if you don't already have this link, you're welcome to join us, anyways. Normally we keep these separate, but I think it's a small enough, tight enough community that we could handle it. Do you say that, say that again, Brooke? Where? Yeah, sorry, my connection is also, I think I'm not messing with my mic. Okay, so normally these happy hours are restricted just to the biology community, but this group is small enough that you're all welcome to join us. Oh, okay. You can, yes. you can fit so, in the room with us. So we're still gonna go to that link yes. though. Yeah, okay. Um, and maybe if you wanna take a break, uh, especially the speakers are welcome to take a break and go, you know, walk around, whatever you need. Thank you so much for the seminar. I'm gonna stop recording now. Thank See you, you in a second.